Hello, WordCamp Kochi, and welcome to my talk, How Better Performing Websites Can Help Save the Planet. My name is Jack Lennox, and this talk is being delivered remotely. Uh, my hope was that I would be able to do this live, uh, but unfortunately we've had some issues get in the way uh, with the internet, and uh, so this is a pre-recorded version, but rest assured that I only recorded this a few hours ago, so um, you are seeing this almost live. And I will be around afterwards to answer any questions you may have uh, on Twitter and maybe in some other format. We'll see how that works, but I'll certainly be following along as this gets aired. So as you can probably tell, this is going to be a talk about sustainability and the Internet. This is what's at stake. This is the, the blue marble that we all live on. And I'm going to introduce this by talking about how I came across this topic. This is a pro project known as Blackall. And uh, this came about, I think in 2007 was when it was first launched, and it came off the back of the idea of how much power could Google save if it had a black background instead of a white background. There's quite a long story to it, and there's some interesting data around how the newer types of screens that we're using these days uh, actually use more power to produce black than produce white. So it kind of applied more to CRT monitors and the older monitors that we used to have than it does now. Um, but there's a whole thing. It's, it's, it's really worth checking out. It's quite an interesting project. And then bringing us up to the present day, or more or less the present day, earlier this year, a university in the UK carried out a study of YouTube and we're looking at design changes that YouTube could make that might cut the CO2 emissions of the platform. And I'll talk about that a bit later on in this talk. A bit of a background about me, uh, I've been working as a kind of freelancer and then within agencies and then within startups from 2009 to 2013. Uh, since 2013 I've been working at Automatic um, and I've been on the WordPress.com VIP team since 2016, actually that date is wrong and I should have updated that but never mind. Um, and then another really kind of strange thing that's become a part of my life is that I've become quite political uh, and in 2017 I stood as a parliamentary candidate for the Green Party of England and Wales and actually as we speak I'm doing that again so I'm, uh, we have our general election which some of you may know about on the 12th of December and where I live I am our parliamentary candidate uh, for whatever that's worth. So I, having seen projects like Blackhall, I first became more involved in the idea of the sustainability of the internet at the Mozilla Festival, which is an annual event which kind of rotates around. It's actually been in London for quite a long time now, but it, the idea was that it would move around, and I think it's due to move next year. Uh, it's a big open source festival, and I attended it in 2017 and saw a talk by a guy called Chris Adams, who has done a lot of fantastic work on internet sustainability, and um, he held this session called How to Build a Planet-Friendly Web, and it piqued my interest, and I, I went along and heard a lot of the information, some of which is now in this talk that I'm going to present to you, and a lot of that's evolved as well since 2017. Um, but I hadn't really thought about the internet not being planet friendly, so it was a really kind of interesting thing for me to hear. The problem, as you may have guessed, is that the internet has an enormous carbon footprint. To give you an idea of how big, uh, there was a study as part of the Greenpeace Click Clean campaign, which I'll talk about again throughout this uh, talk. Um, in 2012, they estimated that the IT sector um, has the, it, as, as if it were a country, it would be the third largest country on Earth by its electricity consumption. And this electricity consumption is rapidly growing. Uh, this, was carried, this was part of a study uh, in the journal Nature carried out earlier this year. And as you can see, the internet is forecast to be using up to 21% of projected electricity demand by 2030. Uh, and you can see how that breaks down here. It's quite scary. And the reason this is bad is that the world's energy mix is not very clean. Basically, we're producing a lot of carbon dioxide for the electricity that we use. This is a fantastic project called the Electricity Map. Uh, there's a link in the slides, and I will share all these slides, so don't worry about trying to follow along too closely. But electricitymap.org, um, they're gradually getting more and more data, so you can see there are a few states within India that are now uh, being tracked. Um, they sort of come on and off, it depends if the APIs are available and what information they can get. 
Um, but yeah, this kind of gives you a sense of how we're not producing energy very cleanly. Some countries are doing quite well, uh, but lots of countries aren't doing so well, including the UK, I'm sad to say. Sometimes we're better because this is also live data. So when the winds are blowing and a lot of our offshore wind is being active, then our carbon intensity gets better. Um, the internet produces about 1 billion tonnes of CO2 every year. And to put that into perspective, that's about the same as global air travel, uh, which is quite bad. And because of that energy mix that I just showed you, the internet is the largest coal-fired machine on Earth, or it can be thought of at least in that way, which is quite a scary thought. This was put into stark contrast by uh, Mozilla again. They, did an, they do an annual internet health report, and they did one in 2018 where they shone a particular light on this problem. And one of the quotes in that article is that sustainability should be a bigger priority, especially as the internet expands into new territory. Now, as a world, many of you will probably be aware of the work that's going on to try to deal with this big CO2 emission problem and the climate change that it's causing. Uh, the Paris Agreement is the kind of the thing that everyone is now working uh, together on. Uh, well, almost everyone. It's uh, That's been in place since 2015. Um, there is one country that sadly is not currently involved in the Paris Agreement. However, the good news there is that there's a project called America's Pledge, uh, which I think is uh, primarily led by Michael Bloomberg. Um, and this basically represents more than half of the US economy and population still keeping to the pledges of the Paris Agreement. So that is still kind of being followed by almost every country and half of the country that more than half of the country that isn't currently involved. There are more uh, closer to home. There are other efforts going on within our industry specifically to try and sort this out. So one of the best ones of the, the best uh, campaigns that I'm aware of is the Greenpeace Click Clean campaign, where they look at all of the big internet companies and hold them to account for their sustainability. And um, you can download the 2017 report. I believe there is a new one come, due to come out. There wasn't one last year, but there is a new one that they're working on at the moment. Um, but it's really good to look at the one from 2017 and all the work that's been going on since then. Poorly performing websites are bad for the environment, I'm afraid to say. And this gives you some idea of how this problem is getting worse. So this is a graphic showing page bloat. As you can see in 2011, the average web page was just under a megabyte. And at the start of 2017, the average web page had grown to just over three megabytes. And this graphic kind of breaks down what's going on there. So you can see in 2011, uh, the vast majority of the weight of a page was images. Uh, there were some scripts as well mixed in with that. Um, and then everything else is really quite small. You can see in 2017, images are taking up a lot more, um, but also there's some new contenders coming in that really didn't factor in 2011, like video. Um, and I think this, unfortunately, this graphic, uh, this data isn't being tracked in the same way, so I, we can't actually look at exactly what it's like now, and I'll explain that in a bit. But I would imagine video in 2019 is an even bigger chunk, um, a much bigger chunk than it was in 2017. But there's some other interesting things going on there, so you can see a lot more JavaScript is coming down as well now um, as we download web pages. So a projection that was made when this data was taken from the HTTP archive was that the average web page by last month would be about 4 megabytes. Um, the HTTP archive switched from using averages to, me, uh, to median uh, uh, as a measure, so we don't actually know for sure if that's the case. But uh, looking at the way the median has grown, it probably is, the average web page probably is now about four megabytes, which is pretty big. So coming back to that University of Bristol study, that uh, university in the UK that I was talking about, uh, they studied uh, YouTube and they were looking at design changes that might reduce the energy usage of the website and therefore reduce its environmental impact. And the paper, you can actually go and read it if you like. It's it's actually not too bad, it's not too long, uh, and it's quite interesting to read through all of the things that they considered and how they came with to, uh, came to the conclusions that they come to. But the um, they focus on some very interesting ideas which I hadn't previously heard about. And so the first one of those is sustainable human computer interaction. Now, sustainable human computer interaction is where you design uh, services that 
promote more sustainable behaviors. So this is an example of a website which has actually recently been rebranded. Um, it was it was called Loco2. It's a website for booking train services across Europe. And one thing it does is it shows a carbon calculator as you're checking at the point that you're actually buying the ticket, showing you how much CO2 you're saving. So this is like a design um, a design factor which would hopefully promote more more sustainable behavior by making you realize that it, in the process of traveling by train you're saving CO2 versus flying CO2 emissions. Um, within the UK there's a website called uh, well this is Great Western Railway which is one of our railway operators and they have a similar thing um, although in, instead of using the European thing of comparing it to flying they show you how your uh, CO2 emissions compare to going by car um, so you can see there's that that there, and this is again this SHCI, Sustainable Human Computer Interaction idea. There's a, an app called Mobike. Uh, I don't know if Mobike are, are in India yet, but I know they're in. The, I think it's a Chinese company. They're in lots and lots of countries now. And this is one of these bike renting apps. Um, and one thing I like about Mobike is that they show you how much carbon you've saved by taking bikes. Uh, so this is from my my personal account, um, and I just noticed this. Uh, when I was using the app. I quite like this. And then there are other ways that this sustainable human computer interaction can work. So you can see uh, on this website, Untold, which is a coffee roaster, that at the point of checkout you can potentially pay for a CO2 neutral delivery. Now this does, this kind of is an offset thing, so um, there's still some complexity in the extent to which this is necessarily that good, but it is at least promoting the uh, a more sustainable behavior like a, a better option potentially for people that are buying coffee um, but yeah there's ethical things about whether it's right to make this like something that people feel bad about and make them pay for it uh, I'm not saying this is a great way of doing it but it's an interesting idea so another idea that's um, hit upon within the paper is sustainable interaction design and this is where we actually change the way that our products are designed to make them use less energy so the thing that the paper highlighted was that if YouTube switched off video playback while watching music videos, there's potentially quite a significant energy saving and therefore quite a big emission saving as well. Now, many of you are probably aware that one of the things that people use YouTube for now is just listening to music. And most of the time when people are doing this, the video is still playing and like no one's actually watching it and it doesn't need to be happening. Um, interestingly, YouTube have actually packaged this in the premium service where you can turn off video playback. So it's kind of strange because you pay money to get less. Um, but the paper was saying that this is something that YouTube should make standard because it would save potentially a lot of energy if you could just listen to things rather than have to have the video playing. So this now comes to the niche that I'm interested in and what we're going to be talking about, which is sustainable web design. And the real point here, like if, if I haven't made this clear already, is that every byte transferred represents energy being consumed. Now, if we want to try and understand how much energy is consumed by the data we're transferring, uh, there are various things we can look at. Uh, one particular thing here which I find interesting is from the ACEEE, -E, which is the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. They did a study in 2012, and the link is, is on this, so if you want to look at this yourself, that's, you're very welcome to. Um, and this kind of shows you how much power goes into getting the bytes down the wire or over the wireless networks to your device. And I'll cut a long story short, uh, this is how they break it down, so and it, it can vary a huge amount depending on how you're actually getting this data, but this is, a, this is an average um, uh, estimation. So you can see almost half of the energy is the data center providing the content to you, um, and then a significant chunk, probably about a third, is your, just over a third, sorry, is your device, that's kind of the thing you're using to download, to, to view that data or watch the video or look at the images or whatever. And then about just under 15%, 14%, that's the transportation. So that's all of the switches and relays and everything else that are in between you and the content you're getting from the data center. And to cut a long story very short, it basically comes down to about five kilowatt hours per gigabyte. So that's about five watt hours per megabyte. Now, let's do some maths. Let's kind of work out what this actually means. So an unnamed VIP client, um, one of our clients that I was working on, uh, their homepage takes about 10 megabytes to download. 
um, which is pretty big, as you know from earlier, that's more than double the average. And so I thought it'd be interesting to work out roughly how much CO2 is produced by working out how much power it takes us to get that bit of content to us. So this is just loading the uncached home page. Now, unfortunately, Kerala is not currently on the electricity map, but the neighboring state of Karnataka is, so I've taken their carbon intensity, which is actually pretty good. It varies quite a lot. I've noticed from looking at electricity map that there's a lot of solar um, energy in Karnataka. And so that means that when it's sunny, obviously, the carbon, you know, the energy production is quite low carbon, but it, it, it changes overnight when it gets dark for obvious reasons. Um, so anyway, the point is 255 grams of carbon dioxide are produced for every kilowatt hour of energy that comes out of Kanataka at this particular moment in time, which was 5.45 a.m. I think that's UTC. Anyway, doesn't matter. So let's do some maths. So the way we can do this, we can first work out um, how many grams of CO2 are produced per watt, because we're not talking about kilowatts when we're looking at web pages. It's, you know, as I said, it was a, a watt per megabyte. So we divide 255 by 1,000, which gives us 0.255 grams per watt. Um, as we know, it takes uh, 5 watts to... Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's 5 watts uh, per megabyte, so that we know that there are 10 of those. So that makes it 50 watts to get our 10 megabytes. Um, so we can now multiply our 50 by 0.255, which gives us 12.5, 12.75 uh, grams of CO2. So our 10 megabyte web page produces 12.75 grams of CO2 each time it's loaded. And I have added the caveat that that's when it's uncached. So on on repeated views, it wouldn't be as much. But to put this into perspective, the American publishing industry estimates that producing a page of paper takes between four and five grams of CO2. So loading this web page once is about the equivalent of two pages of paper. Um, that's a very simplistic example, but it kind of shows that actually digital services have a much bigger carbon footprint than we might be thinking. Um, you know, we have this whole thing, this obsession about like not printing things off and people put it in their signatures, please don't print this email and all that kind of stuff. But it's actually very interesting to realize that by sending, say, a 10 megabyte attachment on an email, that's like two pieces of paper uh, every time you do it in terms of CO2. Another interesting uh, thing to think about here is that the average laptop uses about 30 watt hours, so it will get through 30 watts um, in an hour. So given that our page, uh, downloading that one page once was 50 watts, uh, that's like an hour and a half, more than an hour and a half of using the average laptop. So sustainable web design, what what does it mean? How can we think about it? So I've kind of tried to create a model here of ways that I think we can apply this to the work that we do. And so it's cutting digital waste, improving user experience, and using renewable energy. So let's focus on that first one, cutting digital waste. What does this look like? There's this really interesting idea called the rule of least power, which I only came across relatively recently, but it's something that Tim Berners-Lee has been talking about for quite a long time, and it's one of the one of the ideas that the internet is kind of based on. So computer science spent the last 40 years making languages which were as powerful as possible. Nowadays, we have to appreciate the reasons for picking not the most powerful solution, but the least powerful. And this is one of the kind of guiding ideas behind HTML. The idea behind HTML is that it's a really simple language, which means it's really easy for devices to download it. It's really quick to pass. Um, it's very easy for uh, search engines to crawl it. It's very easy for it, you know, it's theoretically easy to make accessible because of the way it's semantic and the way it's laid out. And obviously it's evolved to be better in all of those different ways, but it's not a complicated language and it's not a complicated protocol uh, at its at its basic level. So a translation for how that what we can think of when we're doing our our work as web developers and people who work on the web is that we shouldn't use jQuery when we don't need to, for example, that's a load of extra weight. And also we shouldn't use JavaScript when CSS will do. We often see tricks that are done in JavaScript for things like drop-down menus, and there's ways of doing that now with CSS. There's a really great website called youmightnotneedjQuery.com. I recommend checking that out as a starting point if you're not familiar with it. And a translation of that translation is that we should be transmitting as few bytes as possible. Um, 
in any way that we can. So obviously there are extremes to which you can take this and I'm going to talk about that as this talk goes on, um, but there's loads of different ways which I'm going to highlight that we can uh, put this into practice. For example, we can simplify the user interface. Do we really need background videos, social media embeds, or carousels? And I've picked on these three things because these are three things that various studies have shown users don't generally like. Um, background videos are generally, you know, most users would rather a site just loads quicker than there's a, some fancy background video playing. Uh, social media embeds, there's been various studies of websites that found that by removing the social media links from their articles, their articles were actually shared more often on social media. And so people generally don't like those buttons that people feel they need to stuff everywhere. And then carousels, there's a website called shouldiuseacarousel.com. I won't give away the answer, but check it out. It's quite funny. We also then want to be focusing on reducing code. So we want to be creating lean HTML. We want to be avoiding divitis and unsemantic stuff, you know, all these extra elements that don't need to be there. Um, try to cut that down as much as possible. Keep it as clean as possible. And obviously, each individual element is not necessarily that big. But if you're building a plugin that has a gallery or something in, there are loads of ways that that's going to get multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And so we, it's, it does matter to try to keep these things as lean and clean as possible. And the same applies to simplifying our CSS. There are obviously all these fantastic CSS preprocessor languages that we use now, things like SAS. But we have to bear in mind that things like SAS produce CSS, which is, can get quite messy. Uh, SAS has got better and better at this, but there are still things to be thinking about when you're nesting and you know keeping your SAS relatively sane if you're using SAS and looking at what CSS actually gets produced. And then finally, using less scripts. And there's loads of ways that can that can go on, obviously not using JavaScript if you don't need to. Um, but also thinking about, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll stay on this slide. Also thinking about the services that you enqueue. And um, if you're using a library for something, you know, and then you're loading it on every page when maybe it's only needed on one page or all sorts of things that we can be thinking about with that. So this is a quote that I really like from uh, a guy in the UK called Hayden Pickering. The most performant, accessible, and easily maintainable feature of a website is the one that you don't make in the first place. And I would add sustainable to that list of things as well. Another concept which we can look at with some of our code is something called tree shaking. Uh, there's a particularly a good way of doing this with CSS. There's a, a, a tool called Purge CSS, and this will actually check if you have unused CSS on your website. There are also coverage tools now within Chrome. Um, I won't go into them in this talk, but if you look up Google Chrome coverage, it will show you where you have unused JavaScript and CSS on your pages. This article is fantastic. There's a link to it uh, by Sarah Diane talking about how she removed 250 kilobytes of CSS uh, with this tool. With, with Purge CSS. What's particularly amazing about that is that her original, her original CSS bundle was 259 kilobytes and she dropped that down to 9 kilobytes with this tool. It's pretty amazing. And so talking about using less script, which I was saying earlier, things like the Twitter follow button. Uh, people, you might not think about this, but this button weighs 50 kilobytes and a plain text link uses almost zero bytes. And again, to put this into perspective, in 1969, when NASA managed to get a man on the moon, they had about 50 kilobytes of data storage to play with. And in 2019, that gets you a Twitter follow me button. Images. I won't go into too much detail. There's lots of great talks on WordPress.tv about this. Use the correct image, compress images as much as possible, and lazy load them. If any of these things are not things you're familiar with, if you just Google, you're going to find all sorts of information about what you could be doing here. Again with fonts, I won't go into detail, but we should be subsetting our fonts for the characters we need. We should be sparing in how many fonts we load, preferably maybe maximum three, preferably two, preferably one, sometimes zero. You could just go with the system fonts um, and serve them only in the WAF2 format if possible. And it's important to realize that WordPress has been pretty good here. Um, for example, the WP Admin dashboard no longer uses any um, fonts that need loading. It just uses system fonts. Uh, and it's pretty cool if there's a there's some good blo uh, there's a good post about the process that led to them doing that, which I think is is great. Backend stuff again, I won't go into detail. These are kind of Googleable things, but use HTTPS over HTTP two. H sorry, HTTP two. Um, use nginx with fast CGI cache. If that sounds really technical and you don't know, like that requires server level access, 
There are plugins like WP Supercache, which you can use on pretty much any hosting. And I'd highly recommend checking those out. And again, look at GZIP and Brotly Compression. Some hosts uh, enable these by default, but not all hosts do, and it's worth looking into whether your host does or not. All of this is covered in a lot more detail in a fantastic tool called Web Performance 101 by a guy called Ivan Akulov. I'd highly recommend checking this out. It's like a it's a talk as a website that you can just scroll through. It's really nice. Next we want to be focusing on improving user experience. Now the thing is this is kind of all the things that we already talk about and there's probably going to be, well I think there are other talks at this WordCamp that are going to be covering these subjects. So search engine optimization and accessibility first mentality and following best practices. In theory all of these things play into making our websites more sustainable and the reason for that is that when people have to waste time looking around your website because it's hard to use then they're wasting energy. Like every extra page load that doesn't need to happen is a page load we should be trying to prevent. So improving user experience saves energy as, alongside all the other things which are great about improving user experience. So making websites accessible and following best practices mean that people are going to get to the content quicker. So finally, using renewable energy. This is the third idea. Um, well, the third concept that I think is really important with sustainable web design. So this is the Green Web Foundation, which is probably the best directory of green web hosts that you're going to find. It's not brilliant. Um, it's great for finding certain things. But for example, I was trying to see if there were any uh, Indian um, green web hosting companies. And there are two listed on the Green Web Foundation website, but neither of them seem to be active. Maybe they were active at some point, but they're not anymore, unfortunately. So um, there may well be, that that doesn't mean there aren't any green web hosts in India, and I have had a look and I've so far been unsuccessful, but there may well be some, so I'm not saying there aren't any. But in the absence of a green web host in India, um, a really great article I recommend checking out is this How to Build a Low-Tech Website by uh, Low-Tech Magazine. This is an amazing website that is hosted on a Raspberry Pi on a balcony in uh, the Spanish city of Barcelona and there's a solar panel and a battery that keep the web, keep the site online. It's a fascinating read. There's all sorts of other really amazing techniques that they've used to make the sites as well, to make the site as sustainable as possible and to make the images as um as small in size as possible. There's this old-fashioned dithering technique they've used which kind of looks like those old games from like the 1990s. Um and 80s actually as well. But yeah, definitely check this out. It's really cool. Coming away from sort of local web hosts, within the WordPress space, DreamHost is one of the hosts that is listed on the Green Web Foundation's directory, um, and they have a load of information on their website about how they provide green hosting and the offsetting they do. Um, it's not all coming from renewable energy, but yeah, they explain it. It's really worth checking it out. On the kind of enterprise level, if you do want to be doing big enterprise stuff, Google is the best company in terms of their sustainability credentials. Um, I have other ethical issues with Google, so I'm not saying they're a fantastic company at everything they do, but certainly from a sustainability perspective, they are pretty good. Um, and Alphabet, the parent company of Google, is actually the largest corporate buyer of renewable energy on the planet, which is pretty cool. So, putting this into practice and taking it to an extreme, I know I'm actually slightly running over, so I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible. Uh, I have a little project which I highly recommend everyone checks out. I took this really far. Uh, I went with no images, no sidebar, no embeds, no menu navigation, and almost no additional HTTP requests. This project is called SustyWP, and it's www.sustywp.com. Um, I took underscores, the base theme that was produced by Automatic and has kind of become a standard for building themes for WordPress and I basically just removed almost all of it <laughs> and made it as lightweight as I possibly could and this is what I ended up with. So you can see we end up with uh, with the compression that's on the site we end up with about three kilobytes of effectively HTML, two and a half kilobytes of CSS and 588 bytes which is the SVG uh, the little kind of speech bubble with the leaf inside it. So it's six kilobytes of transfer um, and 13.8 kilobytes uncompressed. So that's uh, gzip and brotly which are compressing those assets as they come uh, to you wherever you are. This does pretty well. This is the Google Lighthouse tool for auditing uh, to see how performant your site is. And as you can see, it does very well on all of these things. There is actually an accessibility issue with the menu because the menu loads on its own page. Um, so I'm, I know that's not actually perfect and that is something I've been meaning to fix, which I haven't done yet. 
Um, I'm quite bad at just making a project and then abandoning it. But I haven't abandoned this, I just need to come back and do some more work on it. It also does very well on web page tests. This is another tool you can use for seeing how your site's performing. I'm guessing a lot of people will be familiar with this, but as you can see, it's uh, straight A's on this one as well. And you can see you get a time to first byte of 0.161 seconds, which is pretty fast for time to first byte. Uh, you rarely get sites that are much quicker than that. So in summary, it's 93 lines of HTML, 2.5 kilobytes of CSS, uh, 3 requests per page, the CSS and the SVG logo, uh, 0 kilobytes of JavaScript, and 0 0.01 grams of CO2 per page view. To get an idea of how your sites are performing, there are some other tools you can use. I highly recommend EcoGrader. This has a whole lot of information and is produced by an American agency called Mighty Bytes. Um, which is, yeah, they're, they're a great company. I highly recommend checking them out and check out this tool. Another newer tool on the block is Website Carbon, which is produced by an agency in the UK called Whole Grain Digital. You can type your URL in and it will give you some fun stats about how much CO2 your website is producing. And then coming back to that coffee roaster I mentioned at the beginning, there's a, a service called Cloverly and they do carbon offsets on demand. This is kind of a separate thing, but if you are thinking of building some of those things into your services, if you are delivering products, for example, and you maybe want to have people offsetting uh, the carbon of the delivery, this is something you could maybe look at. It's quite interesting. In the real world, people always say to me, oh, well, you know, um, yeah, these examples are great, but like I work for my boss and, you know, there's there's no way we can actually do this. Like it's all great in theory, but there's no way I, this can actually be applied to the work I do. Well, I would counter that with webperf.xyz, which is this great uh, article performance leaderboard. Um, I highly recommend checking out the website. They show you a whole bunch of top publishing companies and how fast their fastest articles are at loading and therefore kind of implied in that is how few kilobytes they're using. So I took the top example from Thought Company. So the Thought Company, this article which has images, it has all sorts of, you know, all bells and whistles of a typical website and this page loads in 201 kilobytes. Now when you compare that to the 10 megabytes I was talking about at the start, that's pretty impressive, 0.2 megabytes. Gov.uk, this is the big um, this enormous website and network of websites that the British government have. Um, it's they've one of the good things that has happened in the in UK politics uh, in the last sort of ten years or so is that a lot of money was spent on the government digital services program, which employed lots of very good web developers uh, and web people to do lots of work and make basically completely overhaul all of our services that you can do online. Long story short. The homepage for gov.uk only, only takes 417 kilobytes to download. Whole Grain Digital, the company that make Website Carbon, they've recently uh, renovated their website and it loads in about 213 kilobytes. Uh, this is Justin Tadlock's Exhale theme. Justin Tadlock is obviously a, a legend in WordPress theming and he's been really focusing on, on uh, performance recently. Um, and this new theme, the demo homepage, is 423 kilobytes. There's images and everything else in it. Uh, Low Tech Magazine, that example I showed you, theirs might sound quite big at 435 kilobytes, but if you check out that page, it's actually, there's like loads of images and all sorts of other content in there, so to fit all of that into just under half a megabyte is quite impressive. And this is one of my favourite examples, this Global Warning website, this was put together for the 10k apart, uh, 10k apart challenge where you have to fit as much as you can into a 10 kilobyte project. Um, it's just 11 kilobytes, which considering that that's only just under double, like basically my project, but does way more. There's like animations, there's all sorts going on with this. It's really exciting and I recommend checking it out. There's a link in the uh, stuff at the end. In conclusion, we need to set performance budgets. I would say that 500 kilobytes per page is a good starting point. If you can't quite keep to that, that's, that's fine, but we shouldn't be producing home pages that take 10 megabytes. We should be adopting the rule of least power and most importantly, no one will care about their websites if we're all fighting over water. Uh, this is a serious issue and we should take it seriously. Everyone should sign this petition. This is for the sustainable servers by 2024. This is being run by the industry. Highly recommend reading about it. There's a link at the bottom. Everyone should sign the Sustainable Web Manifesto. There's a great conference that's all about this, so if this really interests you, uh, it's going to be going on next year. This is actually quite an old screenshot, but yeah, Sustainable UX, I spoke at the one that happened this year, in February of this year. Um, it's going to be going on again next year, and I highly recommend uh, that people get signed up if this is of interest to them. 
there's a great Slack community um, and a community of people that care about these issues at climateaction.tech. And in conclusion, sustainable websites are more performant, more user-friendly, more accessible, more server-friendly, and more planet-friendly. We're hiring. If you go to wpvip.com slash careers, if you want to come and work for us. Vararaya Dikum Nandi, I think. I actually have closed the thing down. I've probably just completely murdered uh, your language, and I'm really sorry. But this should say thank you very much, and I hope it does. <laughs> but... Uh, if there are any questions, I'm available on Twitter, and you can also email me, jack at automatic.com. And I think that's all. That's my, oh, and this is my bibliography, yeah. So if you, these slides will be available, and you can download all of the stuff that I talk about from these links. Um, this is where this will stop. I may now be live in the room in some way answering questions, or I may not. And I'm sorry I've run over slightly. Thank you very much. I hope you have a fantastic WordCamp, and I hope to see as many of you as possible in person at some time in the future. Thank you.